Oh, sure. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks to Bettina and, and everyone for inviting me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about indoor environmental quality, which is one of my areas of expertise, I suppose you could say. Um, I am a professor at Carleton University, and I've been here for 12 years now. Um, but before that, I got a PhD in uh, building engineering from Concordia University. And now, um, as I said, I'm at Carleton and I teach in a new program um, at the grad level called building engineering, same as the, the program I once uh, took. Um, so what we're going to do today is a high level overview of uh, indoor environmental quality. Um, but I'm going to sort of mix that in with um, applications in building design, as well as interfaces. Um, so hopefully this makes sense, because I, I believe um, we can't talk about indoor environmental quality without talking about um, designing buildings to provide indoor environmental quality and the systems that people might use to improve their comfort, um, because buildings should be interactive. In, indoor environmental quality is not something we just want to provide to people uh, based on some standards. We want to give people the opportunity to um, fine tune their conditions, just like you could do in your car, for example, uh, or in an airplane. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a case study. And I, I think it's a case study where um, the occupants were maybe not considered as well as they might have been. Um, so it's perhaps a cautionary tale in an otherwise uh, successful building. So this is the Ecoterra house, and it's a, a house that was built about 15 years ago. It was actually trucked on site via modules. Um, but what makes it particularly special is it's near net zero energy. So it um, produces almost as much energy as it uses over the course of a year. So it's connected to the electricity grid. but um, most of its energy comes from uh, its roof that I'll, I'll show in a moment. So it has large solar panels on the top part of the roof. And um, this building has, or this house has a ground source heat pump. It has features that um, reduce the heating load significantly in the first place. So all these large windows are south facing. Um, and these are meant to bring in lots of solar radiation in the winter. So this is in um, Quebec near Montreal, and the heating load is high. Um, but by having uh, or by taking advantage of the, the low solar angles and the relatively sunny winters, um, and the fact that snow on the ground, not here, but snow on the ground in the winter actually helps reflect more solar radiation into the house, it can significantly reduce its um, heating load so that the amount of heat it uses through the ground source heat pump is pretty minimal. Um, and here's the inside of the house. Um, uh, and I should have mentioned this was designed by a, a large team of um, researchers and other experts. So from a textbook perspective, it's, I'd say, near perfect. Everything from the window selection to the insulation to the form of the house. It's elongated in the east-west direction so that the south-facing windows are, are quite large. Um, and now the reason I'm showing these photos is you could see a, a floor that's not wood, it's not um, carpet, it's these ceramic tiles. And under that, there's actually four more inches or 10 centimeters of concrete. Um, and the idea here is that when the solar radiation hits the floor, instead of that energy quickly dissipating into the air, um, it gets stored into the floor. So the, the floor warms up a little bit, not that much because concrete is so good at storing heat. Um, and even a small temperature rise of concrete represents a lot of energy stored. We want that to happen because A, we don't want the air to immediately heat up and, and overheat, because uh, as soon as you overheat the space, people will um, open windows, close the blinds, maybe turn on air conditioning, all these things we don't want to happen. Um, but the other benefit is that energy gets stored during the day and it releases overnight. So even when the sun is down, the floor will still feel a little bit warm to the touch. 
And as long as the floor is warmer than the air, then the floor will release heat to the uh, air above. Um, so the, the floor is a, a key part of the design here. Um, and maybe I'll even point out there's a, a wall here that's similarly thermally massive. Um, so even if the solar radiation uh, extends past the floor, we have this wall here to help absorb, absorb more energy. So it's really optimized in that sense. The cautionary tale comes in that um, I would say the designers did not fully recognize the um, degree to which the occupants would uh, intervene in the design effectively. Um, so what do we see here? Well, the blinds are a little bit down, but maybe more importantly, that whole floor is covered or not the whole floor. A lot of the floor is covered in a carpet and furniture. This effectively renders that floor fairly ineffective for its purpose um, because the whole point was that the sun had to hit the floor directly. Um, but here we're insulating or obstructing the floor. Um, so a lot of the benefit that we expected did not happen. And it, it might be tempting to say, oh, those occupants don't know what they're doing or they weren't educated uh, on how to use their own home or something like that. But I take a different stance that um, we should have anticipated what the occupants would do. Because a lot of the times, this case included, the occupants are pretty sensible. Um, of course, they don't want to walk around on a uh, concrete or, or tile floor um, in bare feet when they wake up in the morning, because that's going to feel really cold. Um, and, and there's actually standards that say you need to keep um, concrete or, or any conductive floors warmer um, than what we might typically imagine. So something like 26 degrees, um, which this certainly would not be. This is not a, uh, uh, it does not have a heated floor from um, a, a radiant system or an electric system or something like that. So the takeaway here is that I think the occupants behaved pretty logically, but we didn't anticipate that. But there's more examples. Um, so this is the north side of the house. And again, I, I mentioned sort of textbook perfect. This house is near perfect. It's near optimal from an energy perspective. Um, north facing windows, lose quite a bit of heat out of them in the winter. Um, and the sun will rarely shine in, uh, certainly not in the winter. So why put windows on the north? Well, you might do that because of lighting and, and daylight. So it, thermally, those windows would not be good, but for views and daylight, they're important. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why the occupants put in a lot more lighting than was originally installed. The problem here is that the occupants put in um, lighting that they, they got from Ikea or something, they didn't really think about the efficiency. If the designer had anticipated this, um, they could have put in energy efficient fixtures and, um, and bulbs, but that didn't happen. Um, probably the biggest problem and energy hog in this house is related to the garage. So the designers assumed the garage would store a car or perhaps some bicycles, some tools, et cetera. But the designers didn't uh, consider the fact that we're, we didn't have a sort of nuclear family move in. Instead, we had um, some retired, a couple of retired people, and they were using the garage as a workshop. Um, and whereas the original design did not have the garage heated, um, the, the occupants wanted it heated. And so instead of integrating the heating in this garage with the house, which was very efficient, they installed a new heating system, which was very inefficient. Um, and this heater used about a third as much heating energy for this small garage uh, compared to the entire house. So I, hopefully the, the message here is clear. We need to think about comfort. We need to think about occupants. Um, and we need to recognize the diversity of occupants. There's no such thing as a standardized occupant, right? And, and I think Occupants are pretty logical. Um, they just not might not be aligned with what we're expecting. So this is why it's important to really um, have occupants at the design table and to think about who might um, move into our home or, or into our office that we design or our school, et cetera. 
Um, and a really important point before we get into comfort and, and IEQ too deeply um, is the fact that people are extremely valuable. And there was a time when we thought, well, if we want to save some energy, let us sacrifice the comfort or the indoor environmental quality. And probably the best case of this is in the oil crisis um, of the 1970s, where building operators around the world, um, but, but maybe famously in North America, cut down or even stopped ventilating office buildings. And people got very sick from that. So sick that um, they didn't show up to work. And when they were at work, they were not very productive. Um, and of course, the irony here is that the, the cost of that, of, of productivity, um, um, absenteeism, et cetera, way exceeded the saved energy costs. Um, so it's really important to put things in perspective here. With that said, I believe we can achieve energy savings and better comfort. And that's sort of the, one of the messages here today. Um, so I'd like to go through a few sort of theoretical questions just to get your mind thinking about what a designer would consider. Um, and then we'll get into more examples, some more theory and so on. So one of the, I won't say the first questions a building designer might consider, but an important one that they may or may not consider is whether we should fully automate or um, fully manualize, if you will, uh, all of the systems. So everything from heating, lighting, um, cooling, ventilation, et cetera. So the engineers will tend to say, we should fully automate everything. These occupants don't know what they're doing. They don't understand how to use systems. They will abuse them. They will um, turn up the thermostat, open the window. They'll have lots of fresh air. They'll have well, lots of wasted heat. Um, they're they're going to leave the lights on when they're gone. They're going to leave the window open when, when they leave, and, and that's going to cause pipes to freeze and so on. But the, the comfort expert or the, the psychologist will say, actually, you know, we, we need to put some faith in people, and there's a lot of value in letting people control their environment. I mean, it turns out, and I'll show some examples, that people are actually more comfortable for, for two exact same um, buildings, exact same conditions. If one provides some degree of control and the other provides no control, people will report being more comfortable if they have control. And I, I think this is pretty intuitive if we think about our lives. Um, you know, there, there's all sorts of things that we'd like to have a little bit of control over, whether it's our posture, the clothing we wear, um, you know, the, the temperature in our office, in our homes, et cetera. So it's really important to provide that control. Um, and, and so both perspectives, I think, are, are reasonable. And probably the sweet spot is somewhere in between. Um, and it depends a lot on the building. So if you feel a lot of ownership over the building you're in, um, like, let's say it's your, your house or your apartment, um, you're responsible for the energy bills, perhaps. Um, you know that if you do something like leave the window open and it rains, like that's gonna be your problem. Um, you're probably gonna behave a lot more responsibly than if you're in a shopping mall, a hotel in a different country, um, you know, in a school, et cetera. Um, and, and so it's, it's very nuanced, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's not simple and there is value to providing um, control to people that, the engineers typically don't appreciate. Arguably, the, the other professions may you know, push towards less automated, um, and there's a happy medium. Um, let's talk a little bit about how standards are developed. So if you're designing a building, most often you will adhere to some standards. You don't make this up on the spot. Uh, there's, there's things you have to provide according to building codes or industry practice. And here's just one example. Um, so for lighting levels, depending on the space, you typically aim for some level of illuminance or what we call um, lux. Lux is the unit. Um, to give you a sense, under the full sun on a sunny day is 100,000. 
Um, but in a typical office might be about 500 lux. Um, how do we get to those values? Well, one of the ways we can do that is through laboratory tests where we um, put someone in a room or lots of people in a room so that we can um, capture some diversity. And we give them control over the lighting level and we ask them to put the lighting level at their preferred level. And then we can generate a plot like this that shows um, after doing this on perhaps a hundred different people, where do the people generally prefer uh, the illuminance level to be? And this is a real result from a, a famous researcher called Peter Voice. And he found that typically the sweet spot is in this 400 to 600 lux range. Um, at, uh, and so this doesn't translate that well to standards because standards usually need one value. So we, what, what would we do with this graph if we were given this as a designer? It'd be very hard to say. Um, so the, the result is that the standard might say 500 lux with the argument, well, that's about the median and um, anything less bright, those people will probably be okay with. Anything more bright, well, I guess people um, could add a lamp, et cetera. But the problem is in doing this and sort of coming up with that value, I think we forget about the diversity between people and the fact that the original group of people wanted a very broad range of conditions. Um, and then the designer comes in and says 500. And well, if that's what the standard says, then they're gonna get their, uh, their permits to start building. Um, and so the diversity is kind of lost in the process. Um, so that was lighting. This is a little bit more complex still, and we haven't yet talked about what indoor environmental quality is, but, but one of the four areas is on thermal comfort. Um, so are you too warm? Are you too cold? Is there a draft? Um, is the, the window beside you making you feel cold? All these sorts of things. One of the more interesting things to come out of this field in the last, uh, I'll say three decades now, um, it's, it's a pretty slow moving, but also a, a fairly immature field, I would say. Um, there's a model that's becoming popularized that says the indoor temperature that's most comfortable is not constant. Um, it depends on the outdoor temperature, which is, fairly unintuitive, I would say. Um, and so what this fairly complex graph is showing is that um, this gray band tells us the optimal temperature range indoors on, on the left scale, um, depending on the outdoor temperature, not today, but for the last month. Um, and you might ask, why the heck does the outdoor temperature matter? The reason, um, well, there's lots of reasons, but so one of them is you dress appropriately for outdoor conditions. And, and so in the winter, you dress more warmly and you probably want cooler conditions indoors and, and um, same for the summer. But there's other reasons that are more complex. Um, so one of them is you adapt a little bit physiologically, um, but also psychologically. So for example, if you go outside in the spring and it's 15 degrees, you might say, oh my goodness, this is so warm and, and pleasant. Um, if you did that today and it was 15 degrees, now in, in August, you'd say, oh, this is chilly, right? Same conditions, but very different perspective. Um, and so this has actually been adopted into the comfort standard, um, but it's not widely applied in Canada. So, Indoor environmental quality, back to some basics, uh, is comprised of these four pillars or domains, um, and they are indoor air quality, thermal comfort, visual comfort, and acoustic comfort. Um, and there's a whole array of standards and building codes that sort of mandate certain levels for this. They might do it very directly. So for thermal comfort, you have to provide a certain temperature. For indoor air quality, we don't necessarily mandate the um, level of contaminants, so, so how much CO2 or other contaminants are in the air. Um, this is, from a design perspective, mandated according to 
um, ventilation rates. Um, but let me go through them. So thermal comfort, as I said, too hot, too cold, but it's much more nuanced than that. It's things like um, local discomfort. It considers things like typical metabolic rates, depending on the, the space you're in. Is it a gym? Is it a school? Um, is it a, a bedroom? Um, it considers different clothing levels that would be typical in different types of buildings. Like, are you wearing a, a suit in an office or is it more casual? Things like that. Visual comfort um, looks at, um, is it too bright? Is it too dark? Um, but it also considers things like glare. So is, um, is it particularly bright in one part of your sort of field of view? Um, and acoustic comfort is similarly complex when you get into it. So it, on the surface, are things too loud for a given activity? Like um, a restaurant, in a restaurant, we'd have different tolerance levels than in the school, than in a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a hotel. Um, but we also need to consider things like, is the noise annoying? So a mosquito, which is not that loud, is extremely annoying. Um, whereas, you know, music at a concert might be quite desirable. And indoor air quality describes the contaminants in a space. Um, and usually the concern is the combination of the type of contaminant, it's concentration, so, so we measure that usually in parts per million, and the duration of exposure. Um, what sets indoor air quality apart from the rest, in general, you know if you're too warm or too cold, you know if lights are too bright, too dark, you know if sound is, is annoying and, and too noisy. You don't always know if indoor air quality is a problem. Uh, and, and so that makes it, I think the most concerning and, and the most problematic from a health perspective and, and the riskiest. That being said, um, we can be exposed to noise, which is harmful and we don't know it, or we kind of know it, but we tolerate it. Um, but over a long time, it, it can be damaging. So the four of these together represent indoor environmental quality. Um, what is not done well in design and, and in the real world, I, I work in academia, but in my view, in the real world, um, the relationship between them and the fact that one design decision can influence all of these simultaneously. So for example, you lay down a carpet, that might be great for acoustics because it sort of dampens the noise, but now the floor might be reflecting light differently. It might uh, affect thermal comfort. And it almost certainly affects indoor air quality. The carpet and the glues in it might be off-gassing, um, toxic um, gases, basically, um, even carcinogenic, so cancer-causing. Um, and a carpeted floor is going to be harder to clean, so there's more likely to be dust, and that has an impact on IAQ, et cetera. Um, more recently, there's some other areas that I won't say they're indoor environmental quality, but related to human well-being that we somewhat control through design. So they're um, the provision of, of water and um, even food. You could argue that's a design issue, maybe not, depends on uh, your involvement in a project, but certainly providing drinking fountains is in there. Um, the mind and fitness are also in there. So things like um, providing a visually stimulating building that provides views to the outdoors, maybe some plants and trees and um, stairwells that are appealing to walk up and down versus taking the elevator. These all affect the mind and fitness and so on. Um, this is a building that I think did a pretty good job of considering all the types of indoor environmental quality. Um, and I'll just point out a few features. So this is an open plan office. It's, it's the um, National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. And I'll, let's just look at some of the features. So kind of hard to tell from the photo because the windows are mainly over here, but it's a very well daylit um, building. The desks are low, which means that the daylight can get deep into the space. 
This is a south facing window over here and that's north facing. Um, so you can see a window at the top that's called a clear story. And that's really good at bringing light deep into the space. Um, the ceiling is white colored, so it's very reflective. It's also um, fairly free of obstructions. So yeah, we have some structure here, but it's fairly minimalist. So the light can get deep into the space. Um, on the acoustic side, the, the cost of bringing the dividers between um, cubicles down is that sound travels pretty well between people and cubicles. Um, but they've done a good job of incorporating materials that absorb sound. So there's the carpet, there's the cubicle walls. There's also on the ceiling some um, sound absorbing panels. Um, on the indoor air quality side, the, the ventilation is uh, super on the system, and you could see um, underfloor ventilation, which brings air right to the people. Um, one of the unintended consequences here was that the ventilation system is so effective um, in delivering outdoor air straight to the people that they can get away with less ventilation, and the, the building code allows this. The part they didn't expect is that um, the building's a lot quieter as a result, or rather the, the mechanical system's a lot quieter. The consequence of that is that um, normally mechanical systems provide a form of white noise, and so it sort of muffles all of the human-made noise, like, like voices and uh, machinery and you know dropping books and all this stuff. Um, and so I, I can't remember if they had to do this, but they may have had to put white noise generators in the building to compensate for the quietness. Um, but hopefully that gives a sense of how all these things tie together. It's very uh, complex, but totally achievable. Just um, we need the right people with the right expertise thinking about this through the entire design process. A lot of these things are affected by finishes, but other things are affected by uh, structural design, um, the layout of the building, et cetera. So it's not just the architects or the engineers, it's really um, all of the designers. Even the outdoor conditions where the parking is, um, landscape architects, et cetera, can affect comfort. Um, so if we don't do a good job with comfort, we start to get people doing things that are unexpected, um, and often negatively affect energy performance, other people, et cetera. And here's just some examples. Um, these are all related to visual comfort, which are usually the easiest to see, um, but people basically obstructing windows in one way or another. Um, it might be because of overheating. It might be because of glare. And I don't really know. I didn't talk to any of these people. Um, here's some other examples. So. Deliberate design features, in this case uh, on the left, diffusers to bring in air, whether it's ventilation air or heating and cooling, and occupants have covered up the diffusers. It might be because of drafts. Um, I think in this case, it was because dust was coming in from a machine shop, et cetera. Um, and here we have some other examples where controls and interfaces got covered up, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. Here's one of my favorite photos because it just shows the big disconnect between occupants and the designers. Um, so this is a condo in Ottawa and my guess here, but it's purely uh, just a, a hypothesis is that the architect wanted the building to look a certain way from the outside, um, including consistency, but they had to fit a bathroom in somehow. And so they put a bathroom and a, a toilet beside this huge window. I mean, this has multiple problems. One, privacy, but two, that window is a big energy hog and it's completely wasted on this space. And I know that the occupant here doesn't normally leave the window open like this. We did this for the photo, uh, but normally they leave the blinds closed. Um, so there's no view, not much daylight, minimal beneficial solar gains and lots of heat loss and, and gain through this window. Um, there's the code for this presentation, by the way, well-being. Hidden in the snow. Um, and I can see I'm probably going to fall behind here. So if I skip through a few slides, just trying to get to the 
most important things. In um, practice, occupants are still seen largely as this thing that is a nuisance. Um, occupants add heat, they add moisture, they add um, contaminants like CO2 to the space. But they're seen as almost like weather. So this kind of boundary condition that, that changes building performance, um, and that's it. And so if you're doing energy modeling or, or other kind of calculations that engineers do, um, even architects do, usually all we do is specify how much heat people are going to give, be giving off, how much um, moisture generation, um, which also influences the, the cooling load, and CO2 gains, which has implications for ventilation. I think this is a pretty old fashioned way of thinking and it's quite dangerous because the it, it frames the occupant as this nuisance um, that's completely predictable and can be described as a schedule. In reality, and I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, there's a two-way interaction between people and buildings. Um, and I, I've described some of the ways that people behave in buildings and how that affects uh, energy use and comfort. But I think the most important takeaway from the notion of the two-way interaction is that designers are not helpless. They can control, uh, to a certain extent, the way occupants behave. Um, but we need to provide people with comfort and intuitive systems that you know, does not lead them to coming up with, uh, I call them MacGyvered solutions, solutions that you know, we never would have thought of, like taping something up or, you know, uh, tweaking the thermostat or like taping over things, things like that, that, that sort of permanently or, or semi-permanently affect building performance. Um, and you may be familiar with this organization called ASHRAE. You should be if you're interested in this field. It's the American Society for Heating, Refrigerators, and Air yeah. Conditioning Engineers. And they come up with a lot of the standards and design guidelines for buildings. And it's not exclusively, not exclusively American, not exclusively building mechanical systems. They're much bigger than that. Um, it's really a global organization that I consider to be uh, outstanding from an organizational and impact perspective. But um, with that said, this is an excerpt out of one of their um, design guides, and they point out how all these different design decisions affect the heat balance in a space. So basically all the sources of heat um, for a, a room or for a building. So everything from through the walls, through the windows, um, the HVAC system, of course, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Um, but then the people are put in the corner here, which is fine by itself, um, but it, people are treated as this source of heat, just like I described. Um, so there's, there isn't a lot of recognition, at least through this diagram, that actually people affect most of these things. So um, we have fenestration, which is the kind of a fancier word for windows. People can open and close windows. People can open and close blinds. So a lot of these things are affected by people. Um, the HVAC system is affected by people. Um, if we adjust thermostats, um, open and close diffusers, et cetera. Um, so the connections are, are really not clear here. And um, I dare say the connections are not discussed enough around the design table. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can design for people. I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you actionable takeaways rather than a lot of theory. Um, one of the things we can do to make our designs better and our, our buildings better is to look around us. That's what got me interested in this topic is you look at buildings and um, you try to figure out peculiarities. Like if you're walking around downtown Toronto, you see a lot of these tall condos, all glass, um, and the blinds are completely random. And, and I often ask myself, you know, why are people choosing to live in these condos with huge windows, but then they keep the blinds closed for a lot of the time. Um, again, I don't necessarily blame the people. You put someone in a fishbowl and 
in an urban environment, and they're going to feel a little bit like uh, there's a, a violation of their privacy. Um, but here's another example, not related to buildings, but human nature. You put up these barriers, you have a certain idea of how people will behave, but people do not necessarily behave as intended. So, I mean, one approach here could be to put up another barrier and force people through the, the pathway. But I would say, why don't we try to anticipate how people are going to walk and design for that in the first place? And these interventions from the, um, the building owner are going to be costly, right? Why don't we get it right in the first place? Um, so there's a few ways we can engage occupants in the design process. And one of the ways is through something called participatory design. This is where you get occupants or occupant representatives to um, the design table, uh, or maybe even interacting with virtual reality or mock-ups, et cetera. Um, and I think it's really important to get diverse perspectives here. So for example, uh, if you're designing a large condo tower or a school, we need to bring in people with um, disabilities, um, you know, different genders, different age groups, et cetera. Um, because there's no such thing as a standardized occupant. And chances are the design team lacks a lot of this diversity, unfortunately. Um, and some of those are obvious. So for example, there's probably not a child on the design team, but why not bring a, a child uh, with their, you know, with their parents um, to interact with the, you know, the model or the, the virtual reality uh, representation or whatever. But the other thing we can do is just watch people, not in the existing building, because often we're designing buildings that don't exist yet, but um, we can watch how people behave you know, in public spaces, uh, in existing buildings that are similar. We can look at data, um, whether it's utility data or um, other data sets that are publicly available, et cetera. So there's a lot of things we can do to anticipate how people will behave how many people will be in a building, et cetera. Gonna skim through some things. Um, but here's a nice quantitative example from one of my grad students. We photographed a building in Ottawa, two buildings in Ottawa for um, many days in the winter and the summer. Um, one of the buildings, the top one is like I described, all glass, um, not a lot of privacy here. And the other one has more modestly sized windows, and these are called punched windows, sort of more typical of what you'd see in a house versus a, a tower. Um, what we found was that the um, the people with living in this this top building kept their shades much more closed than the people in the bottom building, um, such that the actual open part, the, the, the transparent part of the windows was pretty similar for the two buildings. So no, it sort of showed that no matter what size windows you give, people want approximately the same size of actual transparent opening to let light through um, for views outdoors, et cetera. Um, okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about what I call humans as sensors. Um, so again, learning from people to design better buildings. Um, and one of the most surprising things to people, at least my students, uh, who are mostly engineers, um, when we talk about this design uh, standard called ASHRAE Standard 55, um, and this governs um, thermal comfort. And even though it's a standard and it's developed in the US, it's really adopted by lots of building codes. So it's very much um, Canadian as much as American. They define thermal comfort as a condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment and is assessed by subjective evaluation. So whereas my engineering students assume that this is all calculated based on perhaps heat balances between the human body and, and the environment or very um, rigorous from an experimental or a theoretical perspective, there's a few key words in this definition for thermal comfort. So one is satisfaction, uh, sorry, condition of mind. So it basically says, if someone says they're comfortable, don't 
challenge it. Like, like by definition, if they're if they say they're comfortable, then they are comfortable. We don't need to scrutinize the air temperature or the solar radiation or the airspeed or the relative humidity. If they say they're comfortable, they're comfortable. Um, and the sub subjective evaluation essentially means the same thing. So subjective means it's more or less based on an opinion rather than based on a direct measurement of uh, physically measurable conditions. So let's talk a little bit about building systems and um, the interaction with them, because I think this is often forgotten in the design process. So I'm gonna talk about what I think are the seven important parts of a interaction between a human and a building system. So first of all, we have some human input. Um, this might be pushing a button, it might be waving, it might be using your voice, it might be using a smartphone. Um, to adjust your thermostat, that's what I have in my house. And we do this with some interface, which is usually a physical thing. Sometimes it might just be a microphone or a camera, um, but in most cases, it's a, a physical panel on the wall, like a light switch or a thermostat. Um, that interface has some context, like where is it? Is it reachable? If you're in a wheelchair, can you reach it? Um, can you? reach it in the same room that you're affecting. So is the light switch in the same room as the lighting? Hopefully the answer is yes. Um, and then there's some logic that connects what you did on the interface with the actual system being controlled. Um, and so the logic might be very simple, like light switch turns on, okay, send a signal to the light to turn on. Um, or it may be very complex involving uh, artificial intelligence and learning that learns our habits and predicts our, our desired conditions, you know, based on time of day or what we did for the last month. Um, all these things exist. The actuator is your lighting, your HVAC, your window that opens, your blind that opens, your security system, etc. cetera. Um, the actuator also has context. Does it serve just you? Does it serve the room you're in? Does it serve the entire building? Etc. cetera. Um, and then I think the part that's most forgotten is the feedback, which is, is the system telling us it's working? It seems so obvious, um, but a lot of systems don't do that anymore. And so, um, you know, in the olden days where everything was simple and mechanical and didn't have electronics involved, um, it, it was very straightforward. But with multiple layers of artificial intelligence, electronics, we've, we've actually done a pretty good job of opening that feedback loop, in my view, is not a good thing. Um, and we have communities now that are served by district energy systems. The, you know, the flame, the, the, the combustion that's providing heat might not even be in our building. It might be uh, a block away or, or farther. So there's a big disconnect between um, the system providing comfort and us. Um, and part of the reason for that, aside from the, the elegance of centralizing things, it makes it easier to operate on and control um, with a dedicated individual, is that some people find the systems ugly. And so we don't necessarily want to put uh, a lot of visible systems in our spaces, or, or that's one theory. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly go through the, the seven steps and then uh, try to wrap up time for questions. So I'm going to give some examples along the way. So as I said, the human input could be done through touch, voice, automatic sensing, etc. cetera. Um, this is like the thermostat I have, which can be controlled from, from my bed, from my desk, et cetera, from my cottage. Very cool. Um, but long before that, we had some technologies like the, the clap on, clap off from the 1990s, I would say. Um, interface design also heavily overlooked by designers. And I think the, the whole building control interface is a solid decade behind other types of interfaces. So when you think about smartphones or cars, they're pretty streamlined with lots of user testing 
um, user experience experts, industrial designers, you know, with standardized uh, buttons, sliders, um, displays, etc. Buildings industry is not really there for the most part. The exception might be home thermostats. But if you look at other types of thermostats, they're really not there. Um, light switches, um, blinds, operable windows, um, security and access, these things are really not in, in this decade, maybe not in, in this century, it's quite far behind. So I'll show just one example of a, a major design no-no, um, which is with ovens, and it's not necessarily a building interface, but hopefully you can see the analogy. Um, if we put the knobs in a way that's sort of parallel or, or congruent um, to the burners, then this is very intuitive. And even if the labels rub off um, and you know the, there's a lot of wear and tear, we can still figure out very easily which knob is associated with which burner. But oftentimes we don't have this layout. We have something like this where you need to be able to see the label and without the label, um, you don't know which burner is controlled. Why I like this example is it's a lot like HVAC systems in buildings. There's a big delay. And so um, not only is poor interfaces problematic, are poor interfaces problematic, um, but the feedback to figure out if you got it right or not takes a long time, like minutes. So if you turn one of these knobs, it's going to take I don't know, 10 or 20 seconds to feel the burner uh, react. And that's pretty long, really. Um, but for a building, it might be 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and that's a problem. Um, and, and sure enough, there's lots of examples like this. And this is a photo I took where someone, this was a shared kitchen in like a, a residence, but someone had made their own legends so that uh, people could figure out which one's which. But this to me is a sign of bad design. Um, speaking of bad design, here's another one that's problematic, I think. And similarly um, caused people to come up with their own labeling system. So this is uh, a photo, it's not mine, um, but it shows how one light switch does, I think, seven different things, which is pretty impressive on the one hand, but on the other hand, not very usable. And they probably do this to save costs uh, because switches and movable components that uh, suffer from wear and tear, they're, they're expensive. You have to build them to withstand many thousands of interactions. Uh, but that they, they've really sacrificed usability here. Um, another example I like shows the tendency for building operators or engineers to take control away from occupants. The notion here is we know what occupants need. That, that's their thinking. We know what occupants need, so we're going to give it to them, and then we're going to lock this thermostat away. Um, as I said, this might be appropriate in an airport, in a uh, shopping mall, maybe even a school, where people don't really have ownership over the space, and it's very transient. Um, but if this is in an office or uh, in your home, it would drive you crazy. What we have in this photo is that um, someone put a, a freezy to basically trick the thermostat into thinking things are much colder than they are. So it really, it, it backfired. Um, okay, we're gonna skip through some things. Um, on, on the interface context part, there's lots of important aspects, but one of the important considerations is accessibility. And I'm not talking just accessibility for, for persons with a kind of limited mobility, but really anyone. Um, so this was in a uh, kind of a residence I stayed in. And to adjust the heating, I needed to reach way over my desk, and I couldn't really read the knob, um, even when I did manage to reach over it. Um, and another example, I won't read all this text, but uh, one of my colleagues found major accessibility issues with window blinds. and so. She asked the question from the outside when she was looking at the building, why are people not adjusting their blinds from day to day? Because she was taking photos. And then when she talked to people, she realized they can't reach their blinds and that's why they don't touch them. Um, so the logic part is really important. 
I won't get into too much detail other than to say that um, it's a big issue with buildings because newer building automation systems allow for a lot of customization by the technicians and the control companies. But the problem is the customization means that we have no standardization. And so um, unlike something like a car where you might produce a million of them and you know everything is supposedly very logical, it's been user tested, you know, you had users that said this don't this doesn't make sense. And then the engineers went back and, and made it make sense through better labeling or better logic. Um, we really don't have that for buildings. And, and this is a big issue. Um, and I've seen cases where systems that are intended to work well don't work well, and they basically get torn out and get replaced with something simple. But that's very expensive. Um, Maybe I will show this example. We went through a building and we found a lot of people had covered motion sensors and then we asked them why. And they said they don't understand what's going on and the lights are turning on automatically when they get into their office. Um, so they covered the motion sensors just to prevent that from happening. And so not only is this a code violation, the way it was set up, um, but clearly, the building's actually using more energy than it would have to because the lights are set to turn on. We never want things to automatically turn on, except if it's a safety issue. Like if you're in a warehouse and uh, your hands are tied up and you don't wanna be trying to find a light switch. But in most buildings, we don't want this level of automation. Okay. So here I show a, a I'm sorry, I show a picture of a, a fireplace. The point here is not that you know, wood burning fireplaces are, are good. I won't comment there, but at least they were very transparent. Literally, we could see it working. It's intuitive. We know how it's working. We know how to increase the amount of heat being given off. A lot of these things have been taken away from us as occupants in buildings. Um, and so I think we're not gonna go back to wood burning in, in most buildings, which is probably a good thing. Uh, from a emissions and particulate matter um, perspective. But we can bring some of these features back to our buildings, like being more transparent through interfaces that tell us what the building is actually doing. To explain to us, if something's not going as we expect, at least we know that it's working and there's a reason for it not doing what we want. Okay, let's skim through a little bit. Um, maybe I'll, I'll mention this last one on, on kind of building system and actuators. One of the things I advocate for is personalized control that lets people control the building um, for themselves. And, and when we move to centralized systems, we also move to a model where everyone gets the same conditions, the same lighting, the same temperature, um, the same noise. Etc. This is a problem because different people want different conditions. And the notion that everyone wants the same and that if we provide that, if only we provide that perfect temperature, then everyone will be comfortable is really a broken model. Um, and the best way around it, in my view, is providing personalized control. Um, and there are some solutions for that. I have some photos. Um, bear with me. Do I have those photos? I think I skipped them. But they are things like um, desk fans, even ceiling fans, if they can be controlled separately, desk lamps, um, heaters for hands, heaters for feet, a more relaxed dress code. All of these things can provide people with personalized um, comfort. And I think it's going to be really interesting um, as a lot of office workers go back into the office, they've been spoiled with Having all these things at home, they could purchase a space heater, a, um, a fan. They could, you know, dress casually on the bottom as long as they're, you know, presentable above the shoulders, etc. These things are going to get taken away, and people have adapted to more comfortable conditions. And they are going to be very unhappy. Um, I will share my slides so you have my notes, um, but I want to end there so that there's a few minutes for questions. So thanks for your time and attention.
Yes, if anyone has any questions, please unmute yourself. You can show yourself on your camera. You can put it in the chat. Thank you, Leah. Maybe while we're waiting, I'll just uh, I'll mention one of my uh, notes from one of the last slides, um, which I think is a gap and an opportunity. So a lot of the things I talked about today are not formally taught because you can do an engineering degree where you learn about you know the, the HVAC and the lighting systems and other building services. Um, you could do psychology or industrial design or human factors. Um, which is are great fields for studying people, for understanding what people need, um, for designing systems. There's no one bringing these together. Um, and so that's not something easily done at the undergrad level, but at the grad level, I mean, you could have so many um, theses coming out of this. Um, and to put that further, for those of you interested in making lots of money, I believe that if you were to become a consultant in this area, you'd be a rare kind um, and highly valued. Um, um, I see a question. Oh, I, maybe I'll answer the question from the chat first and then we'll go to you. Uh, sure. Sure. Okay. Question is public space, what are ways to increase indoor environmental quality? It's a good question. Um, so we don't necessarily want to provide all of these operable windows and blinds and things like this. Um, I think the best things to do are try to get it right. So, so a little bit contrary to what I said, do try to provide reasonable conditions with lots of ventilation, especially in um, spaces that are very full. We want spaces to be able to react quickly. So if Often public spaces might have one person, they might have a thousand people in them, and those thousand people might arrive very quickly. So we need a system that has high capacity and can respond quickly. One of the ways to achieve that is through radiant systems, where you're not having to warm up or cool down all the air, but, but you just provide heated or cooled surfaces. The other thing is to provide variation in the space so that the people that tend to be cold can move to the hot spots and the, the people that tend to overheat can move to the, the cold spots. Um, Rishabh, do you want to ask your question? Um, yes, uh, I was just, it's not really a question, it's just uh, uh, that the new certification systems like WELL and LEED, they incorporate, uh, LEED, I studied LEED, so they incorporated IEQ with, with their thing, and now that I've come to know that WELL, and they have done an extensive thing on the things that you talked about. It's all about well-being and uh, adaptability, uh, inhabitability of the building. How important are these uh, certifications and like how how far are they taking the envelope in uh, making build buildings more accessible and uh, inhabitable? Yeah, I, I can talk to well. I think, I think it's great actually. Um, it, a lot of the things I talked about, so not just providing good conditions, but providing opportunities for people to improve, those are addressed and well. Um, there's, I think there's some criticism from, from the academic world, my world, that you know the, the well standard is not truly a standard in the uh, global sense in the, it's, it's basically a, a corporate initiative. Um, but that being said, I, I think the principles are excellent. Um, and even if a building owner or a designer doesn't try to get certification, um, the principles are good. You can still apply them without going through the, the formal process. You know, it's all public information. Um, I, I think you can fall into the trap of having a point-based system, which might, the temptation is just to get as many points as you can rather than having a cohesive approach that is effective. But, uh, you know, that, that's a matter of implementation. I think we're out of time there. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, my pleasure. That was Thank fun. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.